I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm Mark Schwartz, and this is Lori Galquin. And we're going to have some fun today. And those of you who've heard us before, I think what we're going to say today is probably completely different and new. So I think you'll find that refreshing. I'm going to start by the introduction, which is, you know, I, I, I prepared a formal kind of talk, and I decided in the middle of the night last night just to throw it away and just tell you really stories about what's come up for me recently. And um, the birth of this talk came from, I had saw a client recently and he started the session by saying to me, you know, he's 50 years old and, you know, I don't think I ever grew up. And I stopped, sort of like my breath was taken away for a minute, and I, it just hit me how profound that statement was. And I started getting, you know, flashbacks of of Bowen and his concept of differentiation and self development. And I thought to myself, you know, what I'm seeing is so much false self, pseudo self, where the client was so other oriented that his whole 50 years have been driven by not disappointing other people and putting on a mask. And he told me the story that when he was about 20, he had a tumor and thought he was gonna die and went through a post-traumatic stress experience. And, um, that he had never really felt anything. He just sort of had the surgery and went on and did the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and never really processed the near death experience. And he came in to see me because of he was having lots of problems in his primary relationship. He was like starving for love, but he had no friends. So there's interesting contrast between on one hand being hungry for love and the other hand being so isolated and disconnected. And that really made me think that what we need to do is talk about what we do as such a client. And so I decided to be thinking about this concept of differentiation. And the question is, what is differentiation? So I went back to Bowen, and I'm read to you what Bowen says. There's largely determined by the degree of emotional separation a person experiences from family of origin, the ability to function. People with low differentiation lack beliefs and convictions of their own and adapt and react to prevailing ideology. They're highly suggestive and pressured to imitate and gain acceptance, a lot of perfectionism. And some are always looking for others' approval and over-focused on intellect and pretending. Well, isn't that interesting? I mean, Bowen and I think the same way. And here it is right in front of me. And, you know, the simple question to ask as a therapist is, what does the therapist do to facilitate the development of the real self and to be able to facilitate differentiation? And as simple as that is, it's maybe the most complex question we have. I was... You know, I always like to share my reading. You know, that I, I was reading this book by Paul Watchtell, um, who's been one of my heroes over the years. He's written a number of books that I, I just absorb. And this one's called Making Room for the Disavowed and Reclaiming the Self in Psychotherapy. And um, his in his chapter, what he's talking about is attachment theory and how it fits into this Bowen concept of differentiation. And basically what I'm getting out of the book, the book that is relevant to this discussion is that we absorb so much in our family of origin that's really unconscious. And we're not even aware of how much our family of origin influences how much we think and feel and act on a day-by-day -day basis. It's so automatic. And so part of the process of psychotherapy is bringing from the unconscious to the conscious 
the degrees which the person is still operating under the rules of the family of origin unconsciously and helping them begin to differentiate, meaning separate from all those implicit and explicit um, thoughts and feelings that have been going on so that they can become a unique human being separate from their family of origin. And that way not be having intergenerational trauma because all of us are suffering from you know, varieties of intergenerational trauma that are being transmitted you know, subliminally really from our family of origin. And you know, that's not in the trauma literature and the trauma literature is always what happened to you rather than you know, what you absorb through osmosis just by living, sitting in your living room 24 seven. I'm trying to decide where to start. So I guess R.D. Lang and many other people subsequently, although not nearly enough people, have asked about what seems to me the reality of trying to be sane in a world that's in many ways insane. And what it means to be well-adjusted to things that perhaps shouldn't be adjusted to. And at some level, I think that's the dilemma is how much do we actually want to see, like with that old story, The Emperor's New Clothes, which I was forced to be in a performance of when I was 12, though now retrospectively, I think it may have laid a groundwork that was crucial. But like the emperor's new clothes, how much is it useful to dissociate and not see what's right in front of us in order to not be targeted? And how much will that absolutely disrupt and destroy the unfolding of the self? And I think that a lot of the clients, maybe all of them, that I get to see are really dealing with that dilemma. And it's a dilemma that's larger than them. They're really not dealing per se with some individual psychopathology. They're dealing with how they accommodate it to a more, to a broader level of psychopathology and attempted to stay sane, whatever that exactly means, attempted to stay, stay functional, attempted to actually retain some degree of self against all odds. So I think in a way, sometimes we talk about trauma a bit too narrowly, and sometimes we talk about it a bit too broadly, and then it loses meaning, like the word love. Although love is most important and trauma is also most important to understand. But I think what we sometimes forget is that the pathway at least to this country, led through all kinds of trauma for all kinds of people that are here now and that are coming here now and without getting into any political debate, if I can avoid it. Um, you know, many people's parents are from the old country. Which old country? I don't know any old country, but often they were fleeing oppression. They were fleeing the possibility of death. They were fleeing conscription to an army, fighting for things that were antithetical to life. So we have a lot of people that are, by definition, refugees, and they came and they made it work. And they came mostly with nothing. And they came mostly huddled and um, escaping. And I think we forget that. So then the people that came most all of them worked like, I mean, impossibly hard to forge a life for themselves. And then some of them managed to bring other people over who might, may have narrowly, literally escaped the jaws of death to wind up here. So all those people experience all that oppression and all that trauma and all that leave taking. When did they have time to work through any of that? Well, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have. They had to escape and they had to get somewhere and they had to establish themselves and they had to learn a language potentially and they had to learn the folkways and mores of a strange culture. 
and they had to make a life. So, and then all those people, for the most part, I think, wanted to create something different, something less constraining, something more liberating for their offspring. And so often they worked hard to be able to do that. So then their offspring, you know, were busy being Americanized and not necessarily knowing that there was all of this undercurrent of unresolved trauma, but it filters through. Whatever is not resolved, the next generation gets despite everyone's best intentions. And so what I often see is a generation or two later. Um, and, you know, the offspring or the grandchildren who are like, why am I so fucked up? I, I've had everything. And indeed, some people ask that question and some parents ask that question. You know, I worked like a dog trying to give you everything. Why can't you just be happy? But the intergenerational transmission of trauma and unresolved loss and the grief that's never felt and the tragedy that's never spoken of haunts us until, it, until it's resolved. All right. So there are two words that I want to focus on in this next two hours. One of them is avoidance. And second is psychotherapy. Avoidance, I want to talk about, um, evolves out of what Laurie is saying, which is that the, the lowest common denominator of most psychiatric problems is people are afraid to turn to other human beings for comfort and soothing. And how do you repair that? And psychotherapy, which is most people who are listening to this really want to improve the quality of what they're doing with their clients. And the clients that are watching this want to figure out what they need to do different in their life in order to be able to resolve some of their uh, fears of intimacy. So those are going to be the two things that we're going to focus on most. So I just wanted to start with an empirical kind of thing. What, what, what did Bowen mean by differentiation? And so most of us don't have a template of what it means to be differentiated. So nothing's better than Bowen's original idea of differentiation. So I thought that it'd be fun just to sort of look at this. This is what one would call healthy, although I'm not sure I, I agree with all of it now. But let's not, I'm not going to read it to you. I just want you to have it. Go to the other extreme and what would be Bowen calls unhealthy. You know, they're more like my client, which is, you know, kind of hungry for love and looking for love in all the wrong places. And probably what most of us see most frequently in our practice are people who go out and find relationships with people who hurt them, abandon them, neglect them, abuse them, and then keep working harder and harder to try to get extract from that person that which they're incapable of giving. And then they overgeneralize and they say, there's nobody out there who can love me and I'm unlovable. And that's, you know, the universal problem that we see among psychotherapy clients. And what I decided was that probably the best door for us to study this would be the concept of avoidant attachment. Now, in the attachment literature, 25% of adults have avoidant attachment. And that doesn't include the disorganized category. So it's probably a lot higher than that. Now, what can we learn from studying avoidant attachment? Well, Lori and I took the adult attachment interview training. And the thing that sticks in my mind as the most interesting and critical feature of the avoidant attachment is the loyalty to the family. And so what the client comes in is saying is, what happened to me wasn't that bad. Um, my parents loved me. Um, they did the best they could. And uh, I think I'm screwed up, but my family's great. And what happens is they actually distort the event. So if they're locked in closets and burnt with cigarettes, like that was not a big deal. Or if they couldn't 
be fed and, and there wasn't enough food to go around and there was nobody there to take care of them and their parents were doing heroin. It wasn't that bad. And so it's the person listening sometimes, it takes your breath away and you're able to say, how is it that a person can distort, not remember, not feel, and disqualify things that are just so horrendous? And then if the person next to them in group talks about those things, they think, oh my God, that's terrible. And so you almost become fascinated with the, a level of ability for the person to not know, not see, and not feel. And if you, as a therapist, come in and say, holy cow, that, that, that's a, that was terrible, then in some ways it scares them because you're having them look at something that they've avoided looking at for a lifetime. Now, the critical feature to me of that is that what you did during childhood, which was to avoid feeling the intensity of what happened to you in order to survive, i.e. a survival system, actually continues into adulthood. And the pathognomonic feature of avoidance is that you do not allow yourself to know and see that which is going on around you, you disqualify. And so, you know, if someone is beating you in your marriage, you can disqualify that and say, it's not a big deal. Or if your boss is mistreating you at work, you stay and put up with it and don't say anything or do anything because you've become accustomed at some level to people mistreating you, number one. And number two is, if you allow yourself to see one thing, then maybe you'll see everything. And so I've become interested in this talk in laying out the ways that people maintain their system of not seeing, not feeling, because that then generalizes over to a committed, intimate relationship. And people are getting like 20 cents to their dollar when it comes to intimacy in the relationship because they're willing to tolerate so, so much abuse and so great neglect and just get busy doing. And so as long as they're set up a schedule of doing, 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 they don't have to think and they don't have to feel how empty their lives really are. Like a hamster in a wheel. <laughs> so it's endemic in the adult population is what I'm saying to you. And it's at every level. You know, even in politics, sometimes we wonder how people cannot see things that are happening right in front of us and disqualify it. And I think it's the same system where if you can do it in your own personal life, you can do it out there. And maybe it's functional in the sense that if you don't dissociate, um, then you know you end up feeling so intensely that it would be too great. And so healthy dissociation is probably a, a wise thing. So we're always separating healthy dissociation from unhealthy dissociation. Go ahead. So what I just say here is that the, the goal is you must not be angry at your parents or see them as lacking. You must forgive them and you're bad to criticize them. And that's the golden rule by which you operate from. And that love dismissive and disqualification, the therapist gently begins to question as they walk through a narrative. Because in forming secure attachment, what's necessary is a cohesive, coherent, collaborative narrative. Now, those are the three words that Mary Main used in the adult attachment interview for secure attachment. Cohesive, collaborative, narrative. Collaborative means that you and the therapist are working in a relationship that is safe. Cohesive means that you can, a client comes in and says, I hate myself. I want to die. They weren't born hating themselves and wanting to die. Your question is, what happened to you along the way that resulted in that conclusion? And what they're resistant to doing this set of defenses so that you cannot walk them to look at the input that resulted in the output. And so 
I adopted long ago developmental psychopathology as a conceptual frame. And I'm interested in everything that happened to you in your life. And people like Srofe at the University of Minnesota and other developmental psychopathologists have recognized that these things are like a relay race. The first thing affects the second thing, which affects the third thing, which affects the fourth thing. And that everything in your life that has happened to you conspires to the point where you want to die and you hate yourself. And a cohesive narrative is it is your then obligation in the therapeutic relationship to allow yourself to get out of that denial, minimization, and distortion and amnesia, literally, and, and begin to understand how two and two came to equal four. Now you say, perhaps, well, how does insight, how does that fix the problem? And the answer is that the premise of trauma therapy is that allowing yourself to remember and to feel and to talk about allows you to begin to begin to bring that which is unconscious into consciousness. And so as we're going to be unfolding what we actually do in therapy, the, the, the thing that happens when you've had trauma in your life is a fragmentation of the personality. And so there is a part of you that sees and a part of you that doesn't see. There's a part of you knows and there's a part of you that doesn't know. And so those parts split you and these internal splits become the origin of what we once called borderline personality, which is I'm good, I'm bad, you're good, you're bad. And those splits become unintegrated and you fragmented and make you crazy. And so the basis, I mean, borderline personality is probably the, the very basis of what we're talking about here that looks a lot like what we're now calling disorganized attachment, which is that I'm good, I'm bad, you're good, you're bad. And if you have secure attachment, you find a way of integrating that. So I can be angry at something Lori does, but still care about her. You know, I can feel like I've made mistakes, but I'm not a bad person. That's secure attachment. People who have those internal fragmentations are unable to do that. Well, I like to say that, you know, it's interesting because sometimes parents ask their children who are not, you know, necessarily young, but who are here in treatment sometimes, are you talking about me in that treatment? And it's like, yeah. Usually what the person who's the child of the parent that's inquiring is saying is like every imaginable protective thing. Like my parents did the best they could. You know, they worked hard. Okay, maybe my dad beat us, but hey, you know, we were tough kids. It was a tough time. That's what happened back then. That's just what they did. You know, every... And if people could only realize that that whole context of blame is not what it's about. It's not about who's at fault. You know, are you an ungrateful child or did your parents screw you up? It's like, how can we heal? How can we heal? How can we take the things there wasn't the time or the resources or the ability to work through and help people work through them now so that they don't consider continue to haunt the person the family humanity if you will um and so it's not about i mean parenting for example or being a human being for that matter it's not pass fail you know it's not like oh we're going to look at all the good stuff and then we're going to see that that really outweighs the other stuff so then we're not going to look at it well no it's the problematic stuff that created the problems so we have to look at it but there can be compassion for all concerned in the process of doing that it's just that usually the clients have infinite compassion for everyone else including parents and no compassion for themselves whatsoever and that inequity that unbalance is the problem so in reality what a person needs to be able to do is to begin to think about the varying impact of things upon them. 
but upon them at the ages that they were when those things occurred, like the impact of loss, the impact of what was not able to be present in the attachment environment. And it's almost every person's really obligation in a way, I'm not big on obligation, but obligation to rethink uh, life. Because when you're going through it, you're surviving. And a lot of people on this planet are just surviving. And even in places of plenty, a lot of people are barely surviving. And I think the privilege sometimes of making it to adulthood is that you can rethink from your perspective of all the years spent and all the things seen while in this incarnation, you can rethink the conclusions you came to originally, you know, the ways in which you blamed yourself for things that no child can actually be responsible for or change. And rethinking those things is the basis of psychotherapy in a way, as Mark's saying, to bring things to consciousness that are driving behaviors unconsciously and to think about the belief systems that were formed originally and how these belief systems are creating choices that are so constrained or so repetitive and so disabling begins to be possible. And that's kind of everything. And also the reowning of pieces of self that were disowned in order to have whatever felt like love or whatever love was available, whatever resources could be gotten. We all mold ourselves to get what's gettable. So just step back now. I want to give you an example of what we've been trying to say. Let's say a client comes in and has sexual dysfunction or disorder or sex addiction for that matter. I think the trauma model led us to wonder what happened to them. And of course, there were so many cases of sexual abuse that was a natural conclusion. But our experience over the years has been that's necessary but not sufficient because it's not just what happened to them in terms of the PTSD, but what they observe, absorbed in their living room, meaning that if they watch their parents have an unloving relationship where they never touched, held, kissed, said they loved it, and you know the mother had had trauma herself around sexuality and didn't talk about it or bring it up, oftentimes it's the subliminal aspects of that that are much more dramatic than actual the PTSD trauma. And I think a lot of the textbooks or how to do it books sort of miss that in some ways. So what I want us to focus on today is um, how does one get what's underneath? I feel like what we've been doing so often has been necessary, but not sufficient. People get 50% better, but not 100% better sometimes. And it's what's this underneath piece that we're talking about? And that's where our work in disorganized attachment has been so precious in terms of beginning to have uh, a much more clarity about a psychotherapeutic approach to this. And Lori and I are going to introduce that today. So we're not talking about them and us. We're talking about all of us. That all of us have this push and pull between you know, not wanting to get too close because then we lose ourselves and not wanting to get too distant because it's so lonely. And so our numbing of feelings and our suppressing of so much of our childhood business results in these unconscious systems of distancing. The most common one is workaholism, of course, and staying busy all the time, obsessive compulsive kinds of symptoms, addiction. I mean, so much of what all that's about is binding your anxiety. What is the anxiety coming from? Because when you get close to someone, it brings up all kinds of fears of abandonment, fears of the people who you try to get close to hurt you in a variety of ways. And so what happens is, is that you're starving for love, but you're afraid of it at the same time. And so you feel a little crazy, come closer, go away. And so 
therapists get over involved with the way people bind anxiety through addictions, through symptoms, depression, anxiety, obsessiveness, and are not looking at the functions of those symptoms, which are almost always around approach being close versus being distant. So long ago, I sort of decided that the way I wanted to do my treatment was I wanted to conceptualize that all people have intimacy disorders, a variety of sorts. And even those who have secure attachment, um, oftentimes they're gonna have ambivalence about closeness and distance. In our culture, we don't have a lot of role models. So I've become particularly interested in, in Dan Brown's work, which I'm gonna to introduce to you later, which is, you know, Dan Brown um, got together with David Elliott and he wrote this book. And I, I, you know, I've read this book like six times. And the idea is this, that what their idea was, was that people don't have a template of intimacy. So where have you ever seen a healthy relationship? What is your love map, meaning a template in your mind that allows you to be able to experience a healthy relationship? And when I question people about this, secure attachment or not, I'm suggesting to you that most people have come to accept and expect too little. And they don't really have a frame in their mind of what's enough or a template to be able to demand that their relationship has the quality of intimacy. And so what they, Dan Brown and David Elliott formulated was a way of, of beginning to put a template into the mind of what would be a healthy relationship. So you could come to accept and expect that, meaning that in our relationships, we get what we accept and expect. And if we accept so little and expect to be neglected, that's what we get. And we actually, relationships are verbs. We're creating and maintaining our template. And since we don't have a template, most of us are pretty unhappy with what we're creating. And so it's that piece that I think was always missing, which is how do you create in someone's mind that which they, it's like saying, speak Portuguese, you know, well, I don't know how to speak Portuguese. Well, come on, be intimate. I don't know how to be intimate. Just be intimate. But we don't really have a template of what the hell intimacy really is. And so that's part of what we're going to be talking about as we, if you get through the full two hours here. Cute, pretty good. I mean, the full two hours. That's yeah. cute. So much to say. I, well, I think that Stern said, um the relationship with the mother forms the template for how to enter into all other relationships because it's primary it's early it's, and you know our first sense of ourselves is the reflection in our mother's eyes assuming she's the primary bonding figure so it's the person's the reflection in that person's eyes but a lot of things can be reflected in a person's eyes that have very little to do with the person who's searching those eyes for themselves. And I think what often happens is to the extent that people are missing some of the basics that they might need by the time they get to a point of being able to pair bond with other human beings like adolescence or young adulthood or whenever it really begins to sit in. Um, they're looking for themselves in another person's eyes and they're looking for acceptance. You know, you talked about fears of abandonment. When I was in grad school, I remember the shocking realization that there was a continuum and at one end of the continuum there were fears of abandonment but at the other end of the continuum were fears of engulfment and I was like yeah yeah engulfment that's right so um and what you have more predominantly is always interesting and sometimes changes you know for example I am much more afraid of engulfment you know I was that child that's like no I want to do it let me do it don't you can well, hamper me for various reasons, which we won't go into here. But um, but if I get into a primary relationship with another person and 
everything's activated, including all of my unresolved scripts, then a part, you know, rears up that's terrified of abandonment. And who would have known that was in there? Which is why often it's fascinating that clients look incredibly healthy after a good round of psychotherapy and they feel better and they're functioning better in their lives. Then they get into a relationship and they're like, oh shit, I still have stuff to work on. Now, avoidant then is one side of the disorganized pattern. And in the disorganized pattern, as you remember, there is this unique paradigm where in the strange situation, the child and the parent are separated and then they have difficulty coming together again. And so there are blocks that come up because it's the person that you need is also terrifying. And so what happens in the child's mind is a split and a fragmentation and a part that really needs the connection and closeness that we're all part of the mammalian heritage and the fear that I'm going to get abandoned, hurt in some way. And the child's solution to that is I'm bad, mother's good, and that's what's happening. And that nature of that is dissociation, because in order to maintain that split of good me, bad me, good mom, bad mom, there has to be a numbing of emotions and a distortion of events. So it's that fragmentation. Let me break it down more, and this may be too elementary for some of you that know a lot about the strange situation, but the strange situation was, of course, that well-known test where, you know, the, the mother and the child are together, and then the mother, then a confederate comes in the room, not someone from the South during the war, but, you know, somebody who's in the experiment, and um, the mother leaves, and then the mother comes back, I guess after the Confederate leaves. Anyway, bottom line, where the differentiation comes between secure and insecure in these different subcategories of insecure would be upon reunion. So in a much reductionistic, which I apologize for way, when the mother comes back in the room in secure attachment, both move towards each other the mother picks up the child, the child, you know, relaxes in the mother's arms. The child by it seems to experience comfort and a return to an undysregulated, if there were any dysregulation status. And then the child can go play again, returns to play quickly. So that's secure. In a preoccupied situation, the child goes to the mother. It's like, Oh, it's distraught, and the child just can't seem to settle, can't seem to derive comfort even in the mother's arms, can't seem to have um, affect regulation come about, and can't then return to play. And this kind of like people that are get very preoccupied with relationships, but they can't kind of get get no satisfaction and become calm and nourished from it. And again, then the avoidance. You know, they're like, mom left, mm, I'm still playing, which initially made people think, oh, they're secure. They're so well-adjusted. They can still play. And then mother comes back in. But when they measure, it's like the heart rate of that child starts going up when the mother leaves, but they look perfectly calm. And then the mother returns and they're like, it's like nothing happened. And that's the avoidant. With the disorganized, you've got a combination because what are these attachment, what are these attachment patterns? They're really a strategy under fright for the child to bond and access the adult mammal. And it's written in. And so it gets written in very early. And with the, with the child who has these dueling strategies, it's like they can't derive a a single strategy 
that they can utilize to access the parents. So as Mark's saying, disorganized client might do two things at one time. I mean, client, the future client, who's only a little bitty toddler. So it's like they move toward the mother, but then they halt or they back towards them. They just, it's two simultaneous behavioral movements in differing directions at the same time. And yeah, it's as though something we're battling inside already. Like, what do I do? So take it to the next step. The key feature is what Bowlby called internal working models. Right. And so it as Dan Siegel talks about what happens in the mind, what becomes in the internal working model is what we work with in psychotherapy. And so all the revolution and parts work, whether it be Gestalt or whether it be internal family systems or whether it be affect accelerated or whether it be two chair work or hypnosis, all those strategies are have one thing in common, which is they're aware of these unintegrated, fragmented um, internal systems that cause a person to go two directions at the same time and drive themselves nuts. Sure. Well, first of all, I mean, I'm not sure if this is where you thought it would be useful to head, but you can tell me. Um, first of all, I think understanding why it makes perfect sense is incredibly helpful. You know, it's kind of like, I could have had a V8. It's like, well, I mean, of course, of course. I mean, there are reasons why, I mean, there are reasons why these strategies derive from circumstances. And there are often very good reasons, even knowable reasons why approach avoidance would have been the thing to do. Because if the source of your comfort, you know, at a species specific level, is also the source of what you experience as danger, and that can be very subtle, then you don't know what the hell to do. Or not even the source of danger, but the source of something so confusing. You know, I mean, and again, it's no one's fault in the sense that a mother who herself has a lot of unresolved trauma, for example, is going to give off indications that she doesn't even mean to of anxiety perhaps that closeness to like worry you know like fear and it's not the person's fault that they have trauma it's not their fault that they have unresolved trauma it's not their fault that there's a child here before they've had the opportunity to resolve it but it does flow through and it's transmitted in the interaction and then the child's like you know, doesn't know, doesn't have even the neural pathways to know. So, I mean, the, 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 the result is going to be anxiety. Yeah. To going two directions at the same time. Right. And so many of the strategies are ways of binding anxiety. So why does someone do fentanyl, you know, because they're an addict? Well, I don't buy that solution. It, you know, that what happens is, is that there's a good reason why oh. a person comes up with well, these crazy strategies. To just say that what I think we do as human beings is we find alternate sources for comfort that are less terrifying than relying on other human beings. Because other human beings, even despite their best intentions, sometimes really aren't there for us when we desperately need them the most. Again, through no fault of their own, sometimes. And with all but all best intentions. But I think that, you know, it causes us to find substitute sources for comfort. So workaholism is a form of comfort. So let's give a clinical example. So all this is a little esoteric. Well, it's headed there. Oh, a clinical example. You want to? Okay. Oh. Well, I'm going to give an example of someone that wasn't locked in closets or burned with cigarettes, whose parents are good people. But each parent had their own traumatic childhood in which expectations were such. So 
on one side of the family, on the mother's side, the mother was in a position in the family where, you know, the older children were older and she was the child who was sort of pinpointed as having brought somehow bad things to the family by virtue of being born. That'll get you off to a difficult start when you're blamed for being born and therefore causing circumstances around you to become more difficult for parents. You know, this often happens when parents are having to marry and become parents when it feels too soon to them. And then the child becomes the source of the reminder of what was made necessary, which certainly the child wasn't asking to come in and have all that. What is the client presenting with originally? Well, the client's presenting with depression and kind of feeling unhappy and somewhat immobilized in life, but just a, a malaise that makes it hard to function and that eventually, though they have a good job, is causing them to be able not to function on that job and to not to, to not do their work. And instead, they find themselves looking at internet porn a considerable amount of the time just for soothing. Nothing particularly bizarre, just because at work, you know, they're alone trying to deal with feeling alone. And what's the internal working model? I think the internal working model is that a person should be able to be satisfied. The internal working model is amuse yourself, take care of yourself, don't turn to other people because they have nothing else to give you. And I think the person learned that because in their environment, the parents were so overwhelmed by stressors that there was nothing left over, you know? So it's not like they didn't provide, but emotionally, I think this person growing up perceived that there was nothing left, there was no space. And so they became you know, their own entertainment as best they could. And at teenage years, porn became the entertainment because it was like connection without needing connection. And when the family was so busy with all the things it was busy with, and because of the unresolved trauma, provisions weren't made for the things that a child might need, a child that, you know, like community, like opportunities for friendships, like natural places where the child could unfold themselves because it's like to have to take them here there and everywhere was so stressful given everything that was going on so a person grows up and they think what the hell is wrong with me I had a nice house my parents do love me we had enough to eat let me extend that to a different kind of a case you could give that same history my practice is heavily sex and love addicts and what happens is, is that they, it's almost like eating and then the food goes in and there's a fistula and it comes out the fistula and there's no nutrition. It's, it's eating without nutrition. And so what they do is they get sex or they get love and they feel immediately a sense of relief that lasts about 20 minutes. And then it goes out through the fistula and doesn't stick. And so what happens is, is that they can have sex, but there isn't an emotional connection that goes with it. They're numb. They feel empty. They feel hollow. And so the only solution to the emptiness and hollowness is to have sex again or to take to chase the person who's rejecting them uh, and become obsessed with them. And so what do you do with such a client? Well, inside there's a fragmentation where a part of them is trying to get the love and caring that they didn't get growing up. And the other part of them is sort of manager saying, don't try to get close. If they do, they're going to hurt you in some way. And the only way to be able to work with that is not with abstinence or here and now kinds of stuff. 
but instead to understand where the internal working models became so fragmented, how they became so fragmented, and begin to work with internal integration so that the person can have two polarized parts inside that have a logical origin and find some way of being able to have peace. It's those splits that uh, become the focus of therapy. Well, let's bring it back then to the point I was talking about. I think what he learned to do is not to have needs. So needs get split off and he's low maintenance and everybody in the family is like, oh, you're so easy. Inside, not so easy. Outside, low maintenance. And then the more a person does that, the less they're aware of their needs even. So they just kind of go along, you know, bumping around through life. Then sometimes something happens and their needs accidentally get met and something lights back up again that hasn't been a light in a long time. And sometimes love does that. Sometimes community does that. Sometimes, you know, being in the right neighborhood or being at the right school or being in the right relationship. It's like a part's like, oh my God, wait a minute. Can I really, is that really for me? But then it's hard to make it self-sustaining unless you just get lucky because there's nothing internally that provides for that part. You know, there's just a part that says you're wrong to need anything. You don't need anything. You need to be low maintenance so people will like you. But then there's another experience. Then there's a contradiction. And in that contradiction, rediscovery and growth can occur. So I think the way we say it is, it's an inside job rather than an outside job. Yeah. The client is looking for an outside solution. I need to find somebody who loves me who's consistent and reliable. Well, and that's nice, but but they're not going to be able to receive love that's right. and accept it until they can deal with the internal splits. Right. And so just as an example, in the book, Challenge the Heart, which I've mentioned before when we've talked about things like love, the neglected child within the and it's in a section of the book called What Do Men and Women Really Want? And it talks about the split off child part of self and how the demanding or seemingly demanding child is one who has encountered too much destructive resistance to its own development. The demanding child is one who's been made to feel guilty and ashamed about the uniqueness of his own nature. The child inside the adult needs desperately to experience the full acceptance of its nature and to be absolved from the crippling guilt which has arrested its development usually the crippling guilt is just for having needs um or for having feelings that the system's like oh we can't deal with those needs and we can't deal with those feelings that makes us feel bad don't i don't have those so it comes out as demanding i'm not even sure it's all that demanding but as he notes, when the demanding child in us cries out to another person, like a partner, it often provokes the other person to fall into a negative parent role, like feels like too much. And that's the innate fears that, oh my God, I need too much. And then a person goes back into hiding again, or that part does. And when we then experience rejection and betrayal and an even deeper sense of inadequacy and humiliation, when this happens in marriage, the flow of eros is totally obstructed. So the point is, you know, people are like, why go out in order to get rejected again? I'll just stay on the couch and be depressed. And it's almost like the depressed part is, well, it is like the depressed part of self is attempting to protect by buffering any desire. Because if you're depressed, you can't feel much desire. You're just like, oh, God. And so if you don't desire, then I guess you can't be disappointed. And already inside the person, there's such a storehouse of prior pain and disappointment and the idea that a person is too much. Oh, you said the word lucky, and I want to pick up on that. If you go back to the literature on the avoidance that have been studied in the strange situation, what you as those kids get older, let's say at age six, they maintain that avoidant pattern. And then as they begin to reach teenage, they tend to be extremely negative. They talk negative about other people. They talk negative about the world around them. Um, 
They ruminate about other people's faults. They're always bitching and complaining about something. And there's a, a strong need for control and it distrusts other, other people. And so what I say is, is that if you don't have a solution to the disorganized pattern, you're going to enact it. And the way you enact it is actually quite visible in the sense that the client will come in and be perseverating on the negative. And they don't know how to play. They don't know how to laugh. They don't know how to have fun. They don't know how to enjoy themselves. And so when they get into a relationship, even at the beginning, when there's all this passion, intensity, and fun, they're going to shape it to become congruent with their avoidant pattern. So to me, this is an active kind of strategy. Let me give you an example. Client just got married a couple months ago, and his wife went out to get a credit card, and he said, we don't get credit cards, and started getting very directive about, we're, we don't have debt in this kind of way, we're saving money for this, and laid out his strategy of obsessive ways of dealing with money and forbid her to be able to get the credit card. Now, that may be a relatively normal event in marital therapy, but what it's really about, it's an active maintenance of an avoidance strategy of slowly beginning to cut off her wings and so she can't fly away. And it, a fear of abandonment that comes with over control. And it's the beginning of the end of the relationship. And these avoidant patterns, so if you look at the statistics, the 25% of the population who avoid an attachment, the average marriage lasts about four years, whereas, you know, for people who are not avoidant, the average marriage lasts about seven years. So they're cutting their marriage in half, and it's an active strategy that they use to be able to do that. And, you know, really, I, I do think it's important to look at ways that people slowly destroy their relationship actively because they're unaware of their avoidant pattern. And, you know, what do you do with a client who's perseverating on the negative, who doesn't know how to play and have fun, who doesn't know how to laugh? It, again, they don't have a template because as children, oftentimes they never did play. They never did laugh. They never had fun. They never had friends. And so they don't really have a template in their mind of play and enjoyment. And so perfectionism and achievement and getting other people to be aware of that in a grandiose kind of way becomes what their values are in life. And they then try to impose those values on the person that they're meeting. They tend to ruminate about their partner's faults. If they come into marital therapy, they'll give you a, a whole hour of negative view of their partner. And I really believe that that kind of marital therapy injures the marriage. It doesn't help it. Because what happens is you then get one side of the story. And then if we see the partner, the partner will then do the same thing. And what we're getting is um, a triangulation where they want you as the therapist to join them against their partner. And th that becomes incredibly damaging. So I think. When somebody has marital issues and they see an individual therapist, there's a high risk for danger. Maybe you can explain a little bit about the dissociative process and how we deal with parts. Well, I mean, just to bounce off of what you just said, and then I'll get here, I think. I think the problem is that when a person is afraid, they want at all costs to have the disastrous thing they fear not able to happen. But then the very way in which the person goes about trying to see that it doesn't happen 
creates it. And that's a huge pervasive dilemma that we see all the time. So for example, in the example you gave, the man doesn't want his wife to be able to ever leave him because he's so afraid of abandonment. So then he squeezes her so tight, you know, that she's that if she continues to have any self-respect that doesn't get crushed at all, she'll be squeezed so much that she'll squeeze right out of the relationship and he'll be shocked. Like, how did that happen? I've done everything to secure our future. All I've done is sacrifice for this relationship. So, and, you know, she'll have her equivalent issues where she's doing certain things to ensure that the horrible thing won't happen. And that's the problem with unreconciled trauma and loss and the things that still generate reenactment is people don't know the horrible thing already happened. Now you're living in the shadow of it because you're so afraid it'll happen again and you never want to feel that way again. So for example, the obsessive compulsive has a part that tries to think of every miserable thing that could happen and think about how to not have it happen, which then life's over and all you've thought about are all the horrible things that could happen, whether they did or not. It, it's a life ruiner. But that is a managerial part that's trying like crazy to create safety so that a person is never surprised again, never surprised again um, by something horrible happening. So you can never work it in the future. You can not even work it necessarily just in the present because it's really about something that already happened and what that felt like at the time and how you bottled that up and compartmentalized it and never wanted to feel it again. And everything you've done since then is an effort to stay away from that feeling. In trauma work, what's important about going back to things that none of us want to go back to is to finish with it so that it no longer continues to have involuntary control over your choices and the constriction of your personality and options in the present. Because you're like trying to accommodate to something because it's unfinished. It can get finished. It can get unloaded. And it doesn't have to haunt you for all eternity, even if it has already. Now, what fascinates me sometimes is that you can find an individual who seems to be fairly differentiated, moved in their own house, have their own job, have their own life, and feel pretty happy, have their own friends. And then they get into a relationship and suddenly they become a different human being. Um, they might give up their independence, their sense of self, and slowly begin to just be focused on their partner in an enmeshed, fused kind of way. Or they may begin to be almost like a child. Uh, could you pick up my laundry for me? Uh, could you, um, you know, go to the store for me? and ask the partner to do things that they could clearly do for themselves, but look at if they do it, that's a sign that they love them or care about them. Uh, and if they don't, then obviously they don't. So they're, they're constantly measuring their lovability and unlovability in varieties of ways. And so one of two things can happen. If you have a partner who has secure attachment, um, sometimes, that can begin to heal the person of their disorganized pattern because that person is able to you know, step back and be more metacognitive and be able to say, look, the way we're interacting doesn't feel very healthy. It feels very parent-child rather than adult-adult. And this is the way I think we need to interact. A secure partner sometimes can do that. But more often than not, the avoidant finds the person who's anxious and they end up in this insane battle of approach avoidance in a variety of ways. And so it's almost like the person becomes regressed. And the person they once were, well, oftentimes when they come in our office, they're heading towards a divorce. So it's now you know seven years later, and the person forgets who they once were. It's been happening for so long, it's so insidious 
that it's almost like you gotta do you remember what you were like before you met this person do you remember it? so as they're trying to kill themselves because the person's leaving them they forget that they can take care of themselves so it's almost like they've returned to being five years old and their mom is leaving them and they feel like they're going to die. So they need to take some control of the situation. Well, we were talking about this in a group recently. And let me see if I can say the example. So when a couple comes together, there's like an implicit contract that nobody actually acknowledges. And so Let's say in this case, they came together and the woman was like, oh, I'm going to support you. I see you. I see your wonderfulness. Let me support you while you get your feet under you because you never really had that before and you deserve that. And and the man's like, so he grows and he becomes, you know, outwardly capable and has this a sense of efficacy and and, you know, she adores him. Then she wants to do the same and so she you know goes to school and gets a better job and gets some and then he feels abandoned like wait a minute what the hell and then he maybe does something like find some other person to adore him and she's like what in the hell is going on here how and he and he feels abandoned and she feels like, well, wait a minute, I grew so that you could grow, or I I sacrificed so that you could grow, and then I grew, and now I want us to be together and continue growing. And I think his response was kind of like, oh, no, that's going to send me into places I am unwilling to go in this lifetime. I mean, growing, you know, outwardly, that's one thing, but mm -mm. if I'm going to have to, like, dig deeper than that, hell no. So he ran literally, and then she was like, "What happened here?" And I think, I mean, that's why when clients come here, I feel like they have immense courage because they're going places that other people often, in their families, even are like, "I'm not going there." No, oh, that's fine. Why do you need to do that? We don't need to do that. And it's like. Well, okay, because I can't not do it. Yeah, it just makes me think that if you look at the statistics on divorce, 60% of divorces are related to people having affairs. But why do people have affairs? Oftentimes because not that the relationship is so bad, it's because it's so good, uh, paradoxically. Uh, indeed, it gets scary. So I've become interested in this concept of fusion. In fusion, there's two minimally differentiated individuals who form a close emotional relationship. And one personality is in the process of devouring or being devoured by the other, Fairbain talks about. I love that, the imagery of being devoured by the other. A partner sees the other as essential for their survival, a blurring of boundaries of individual responsibilities, happiness, pain, faults, failures, life decisions, no need to grow up. And outside the fusion, they're lonely. So what happens is that we're seeing this a lot with sex addicts. You know, what I, I'm addicted to pornography. My partner goes out and has time with their friends. And I sit there and I do three hours of pornography. What's the trigger? I'm lonely. Well, you know, you want to give them alternative coping responses for loneliness, but that's not the problem. The problem is they're hollow and empty inside and they're fused in the relationship. And so, it, you know, the goal is to help each individual become differentiated. Usually one person comes in for therapy and you help them become differentiated. What's going to happen to the poor other person? And so beginning to look at this concept of fusion is so important. In a healthy relationship, each person is helping the other become individuated and separate. And so, you know, they're they're healing themselves. So either relationships are are moving towards healing or relationships are slowly dying. It's sort of one or the other. I, I think it's very binary. And if two minimally individual people come together, you know, it's it's it, somehow you want to 
wake them up to the disaster that they're creating, because you can almost see a preview of coming events that the probability of this relationship lasting, you know, is is practically minimal. Yeah, usually the relationship that's problematic is the one the person has with themselves. And I don't mean that in the trite way. It sounds like I might mean it. I mean that when a person has had to disown a lot of aspects of themselves in order to get whatever's gettable in terms of what seems like love, um, then they there's vacancies inside. It's it's the whole. And then and then people are usually afraid to reconnect with those parts because those parts are usually weighed down with the burdens, as Dick Schwartz would call it in internal family systems therapy, that are intergenerational and that are personal too, interpersonal. And so when parts of a person have been made to feel ashamed and less than or too much or not enough, then we try to send those parts away so that we can function and be kind of okay or seem okay or pretend to be okay. But a person can't live a robust full life in the fullness of their nature while a bunch of parts are like buried around the property with the hopes that they never pop back up. And so, but people don't want to go there again for good reason, because you don't want to feel the pain that is held by all these parts and what and the sense of rejection and not good enoughness that they hold. But again, all that can be unburdened, but it takes a lot of courage to want to walk through and actually reconnect and do that work. But without it, then there's a hole and a, a relationship can feel can fill the hole for a period of time. But no relationship can fill that because what's missing is the, is parts of the person. And so when you say it's like a bottomless pit, you know, it's like there's nothing for it. There's no bottom. There's nothing for even good things. There's nothing for good things to Velcro onto inside. So they just pass right on through and a person doesn't even get nourishment, which is why a person can be externally incredibly quote unquote successful whatever success means in whatever context but it doesn't fill it why doesn't it fill it because you don't even derive anything from your own success without a family of self internally it's like you have no family internally because they've been split off and that's the family that has to be reunited and most people in their right mind don't want to go near it with a 10 foot pole, but it's actually the only way to have the fullness of life that a person deserves to have. So you have an independent person who's becoming somewhat differentiated. They fall in love and it becomes an opportunity to revisit the unfinished business from the past and begin to repair it. And if that happens, their capacity for joy and happiness increases and they become more what we call earn secure attached. On the other hand, when they have a fight, what a lot of the good marital therapists like Jacobson and uh, a lot of the contemporary marital therapists are saying is that it becomes similarly an opportunity to repair. And so if I'm mad because you spent more money than I'm comfortable spending on something, it is an opportunity not to bitch at you, but to look inside and to wonder, what is this bringing up for me where I need to have you be similar to me or I feel unsafe? And to wonder, about where my values came about money and saving and spending. And am I undifferentiated in the sense of mouthing something my father did with my mother? Or is this something I can begin to rethink? And can I live with somebody who doesn't think and feel and act like I think and feel and act and respect them as being separate and individual? And that becomes the opportunity of a marriage for a person to become whole. And so I, I love doing marital therapy 
particularly even at times of divorce, because someone's in so much pain that they're oftentimes open to looking at what they do and the origins of what they do that recreate. And it's in loving somebody that we can begin to repair so many of the problems that have happened in childhood that we didn't even know were in need of repair. Who says it will? I think that can also and does happen in a therapeutic community as well. It's like, you know, there are a lot of people and commonalities and dynamics to be able to look into and and to see oneself and to see where where the work might be. So I decided just to catalog some of these avoidance strategies that I see clinically so often. And instead of dealing with the content, I oftentimes deal with the process. The content is what we have listed here. The process is the function of doing this. And these are all functional in the sense that they keep you distant from your partner. And uh, why do you need to keep that kind of distant? Because, you know, you feel unlovable and you feel like the person cares about you. And it's kind of like, I'll be hell bent if I'm going to let you love me. I I'm going to push you away and get what I deserve in some way. Well, it feels out of control. I think most people, when when we're in a thing like this, it's like, I don't want to wait for the other shoe to fall. Let me just take control of this unconsciously. And, you know, like, if you won't leave me, I'll find someone who will, as that famous quote now goes. And in sexuality, you oftentimes see this. It's like a woman will come in and say, I love my husband, but I can't turn on to him. I don't know why, but in the bedroom, I just become numb. And, you know, sex therapists are famous for, you know, wanting to deal with the here and now issues in a cognitive behavioral way. And all that is necessary, but it rarely is sufficient because what they're missing is that um, the person is enacting something from the past uh, with a partner. And there's always a reason why a person shuts off their sexual system. And it's a survival strategy, really. So if you don't understand what, what function it serves and how their protective parts inside are numbing them out, because it's usually not just numbing in the bedroom. It's usually a, a numbing across the board in a whole variety of specific situations that include closeness and distance. So at this point, I wanted to just sort of say, okay, so what do you do in psychotherapy? And if you just take what we've said so far, I just made 14 conclusions, which is that when I'm working with a sex addict or I'm working with a love addict or I'm working with a divorced person or I'm working with somebody who's depressed, these are the 14 areas that become a focus of, of psychotherapy. I've said idealization of the family of origin, and instead of looking at things through rose-colored glasses, um, affect regulation, to notice the absence of, of affect regulation as a child, which includes numbing and feeling. And so many people literally don't even know how to label the feeling or being in their bodies. Internal working models, we've talked about our expectations, most of us are not in our bodies and where our numbness extends to the point of we're literally talking heads. Many people have difficulty experiencing pleasure. Sometimes people have difficulty in knowing how to solve problems. They don't have a template because as a child, when there was a problem, uh, nothing was done to focus on the problem and solving it. A lot of people have unresolved anger unfinished business from the past individuals have difficulty connecting with the self they don't their self system is bl blurred and they're very undifferentiated impulsivity sometimes they have not learned how to be able to deal with emotions and so 
whenever they have an emotion, they immediately start screaming or yelling or uh, are doing something to in a controlling kind of way, rather than thinking about what they're feeling and feeling what they're thinking. They have difficulty nurturing or being nurtured. They have difficulty with sexuality, particularly connecting emotions with sexuality. Difficulty with coherency, beginning to put past, present, and future, and obviously intimacy and connection with others. So it, I think what you can see is, is that if you look at our conceptual model, it, it becomes clarity what your treatment plan is. In, in working with our students, I think that one of the biggest problems is that they don't formulate a coherent picture of the a whole gestalt, of the big picture. And so the client's coming in saying, I need to deal with this symptom, but they have to step back from that symptom and get a much more uh, global treatment plan that has the components in it that we're talking about here. Well, yeah, I was trying to think of a way to say it more simply because I think that when a person gets a list and their intellectual part wants to hurry up and get things fixed, which is often the case. And then they're doing it in a perfectionistic way, which is perfectionism is the perpetuation of self-hate. It's the very thing that renders all your efforts exactly what you don't want them to be because it's part of the problem. So a person gets a list like this and in a perfectionistic way, they want to hurry up and get into some therapy and check it off. Well, what caused them to have to be perfectionistic and so intellectualized about everything and to do everything perfectly in order to feel that they could have some relief? The pattern itself is worthy of inquiry because uh, as Sherry Huber says in a book by the same title, how you do anything is how you do everything. And so the idea of fixing oneself in and of itself is almost insulting. And it's not really exactly what therapy is. Therapy is more about recovering oneself or uncovering oneself or unfolding oneself. And to unfold oneself, you have to figure out what's in the way, what was in the way, and then how did the path veer off so that now you're far afield from yourself and it doesn't feel organic, but like, where did you go off path and how do you get back on path to your own unique unfolding? And yeah, you can't kind of figure out how to get back to the road entirely without figuring out where you went astray. So that's really how I see the process. And all of these things come into play. You know, like, where did you learn that affect was unacceptable and which particular feelings were off limits and why? You know, how did they get put off limits? Because it's kind of like, you know, affect, feelings are feelings. And some of us had a moratorium declared on certain feelings. So it'd be like, okay. Well, we learned to maybe draw with the four primary Crayolas, but we never got that whole big box that has all the different colors. So we don't even have access to our own array of feelings, and we don't have access to our own capacities. And we've um, separated things into good and bad in some bizarre splitting that we've done. And things are far more nuanced than that. And even parts of us that seem bad have qualities that if they weren't out of alignment would be wondrous qualities. I mean, my obsessive compulsive part is incredibly creative, you know? And, and that is very true with lots of parts that are problematic inside a human being. So there has to be an internal, I don't know, beginning of self, like getting to know you again and, and finding out why did things go as they've gone? And then with that is often the neutralization of shame because you realize, oh my God, it makes perfect sense that given the givens, this was how I adjusted to it. But maybe I don't want to live that way forever. And maybe now I have choice. Okay, so let, let me 
say what you just said in cookbook form. Please. Because we live in a world of evidence-based treatment. And so at some level, the question might come, well, how do you see the development of the real self? That was the question Masterson always asked. Okay. And what do we do in therapy that helps people be able to do that? And I'll start out by saying that I had a client recently who was a human doing rather than a human being. He, he had no friends. His only relationship in the world was his wife, and that was very distant. And you know, he liked hunting and fishing and uh, was fairly uh, uh, separate. And he, his father had committed suicide at a very young age. His mom was not very close, so he learned really to be on his own as the stepfather came in and he felt abandoned by his mother. And so he had never experienced really emotions and feelings. He didn't know what they were. So we started with beginning to give him the emotional wheel and let him identify in a cognitive behavioral way what is a feeling. Then we helped him begin to do embodiment kinds of work so he could experience it, that feeling in his body. But the the day that there was a turning point was when I was able to do internal family systems work and had him begin to find the part that had found his father suicided and actually went back into the room and had to clean up the body. And as we allowed him to be able to re-experience some of that from the vantage point of the present, a tear came to his eye. And in it, I was able to help him allow that feeling to emerge and not shut it down because he was actively you know, trying to shut it down in a, in a physical kind of way and release it. And as he released it, there was a, a, a boo-hoo that went with it. And it was sort of like the real self began to emerge. And after that really powerful session, there was a characterological change that began to be seated. And he affectively was much more available than he had ever been before. And we could begin to unleash that process. Now, I think what allowed that to happen was safety and trust. It, you know, he had been here long enough that he really felt connected and trusted me and I him. And we were on this journey together. And it felt to me when we were doing it that I was there with him. Right. I mean, it wasn't I was doing anything to him. I literally was in there with him, re experiencing yeah. Yeah. in some way. And it's hard to be able to describe that to a therapist because so often therapists keep themselves aloof. And to me, doing trauma work, you have to, if you're going to be effective, create safety by literally taking down your walls of avoidance and allowing yourself to be with the client. Right. Assuming you have walls of avoidance, if you have walls of caretaking where that's your inclination, then you have to get out of your own need to caretake the client so that you can be with the client. Depends where you're coming from on the continuum, doesn't it? But no, I think that's absolutely right. Is that number one, there has to be enough safety. And so often there are things that you have to do that help create, that help the person create safety and connection in their lives in very preliminary ways, whether it's the relationship of the therapist with the person and that safety or with the therapeutic community or to be able to have a couple friends because often there's so much isolation that and, and healing can't occur in a vacuum, just can't. And one human being on the face of the earth is not optimal. So, and there are more decent human beings on the face of the earth who are available for such things. They just don't know they're available till they come somewhere that facilitates it. But then once that's there, you're right. I mean, the journey is how do you then allow the person to go back and have something that's a reparative experience 
but not with another person, but now with the self, because there is a self in there already. It's just covered over. You know, there is a human being inside him that was capable of being with that boy, but they were far removed from one another, and there was no one to be with that boy at the time. No one. So to have an experience where the person is able to go through again, but this time the adult self is able to be present with the child and to be there for them in a way that no adult was able to be at the time. I mean, not that cracks a person open in terms of the defensive system and it allows movement, but you have to have the safety to really do that. You know, it's like, don't try this at home in your room alone without a friendship group who's very supportive because it's then it feels like way, way, way too much. So Dick Schwartz's book called The Person You're Looking For Is Yourself. Or something of that nature. Something you're that the nature. one you've been looking you've been, for. Right. So if, if you, you know, it, it does embody exactly what we're talking about because instead of looking in a fused kind of way for the partner to save them, they have to begin to look inside and realize it's the adult self that is there to be able to save them because that's individuation and differentiation. Yeah. Well, Dick Schwartz doesn't call it the adult self. It would be the self, capital S. Like, but sometimes it's really covered over by a lot of protective parts that make it hard to get to it, which is why it's useful to have a therapist who's acquainted with that model. But you know, there are other excellent ways of conceptualizing and doing some work as well, like um, Carvel and Helen Hendricks, Hunt Hendricks, and, um, and Imago therapy. Imago therapy in the hands of a really good therapist is very potent. And the book, for example, Receiving Love is a really excellent model. Dan Brown and David Elliott this book, which is, Mark's read it several times, but it's too large for most people to read several times. Um, but, you know, it's excellent in terms of repair of the systems that maybe have not the template for um, the person to have a relationship with self that is what's needed for secure attachment. So we're going to talk about that next. But before we do that, I wanted to just say that with this client that I talked about, we did the work that you were talking about, which was beginning to have an empathetic relationship with his injured parts and beginning to feel some of that compassion. But the next step for me was to bring his wife in. And the reason is, is because sometimes I think therapists, kind of like vampires, they steal all that intimacy. And what I want to do is I want to turn that capacity for affect towards a partner because usually they have achieved a certain balance of separateness in the marriage that is, you know, kind of homeostatic and equal, you know, kind of equal, that come out it's become equilibrium. And I, what I want to do is I want to shake that up so that his affect can be transmitted over into the relationship. And as that happens, it systemically it changes the partner and the partner's capacity for intimacy back. And I want to do some sort of marital enhancement kind of work to have them restructure the boundaries of their loveless marriage to be able to include affective interchange and problem-solving abilities. As we're working with the individual, we're also working with a couple. And I can then turn the relationship into a vehicle for positive change too. Absolutely. I mean, and you want to do that unless the marriage is wholly unsafe and, and the partner is a move against kind of a human being who's just going to use vulnerability to create harm. But notwithstanding that, yeah, you you want to revitalize the marital relationship. And I literally had someone say to me recently, once I saw my partner and and the work that they did in that session, I realized that things, it wasn't about me. Like their issues that I thought were with me weren't even with me. 
they were with things in the past and I just felt you know love and like compassion and not not even it just melted you know the discord melted because I saw what it was really about and then that gave me permission to look at what it was really about for me I mean you know, and these are not necessarily couples that have had so much therapy that that's how they think all the time. But to see it in front of you unfold is is potent. Now, let's remember that part of avoidant attachment is that you're disconnected from yourself. And so when you ask such a person, what is your life about? What are your values? What's important to you? What do you want to accomplish in your life? what makes you unique and extraordinary, what's important to you, oftentimes you get this blank stare. And it's as if the wiring has just never been put in there. And so what psychotherapy needs to be able to do is have the person awaken to the depth of beginning to identify who they are and what their life is about in some deeper sort of way. And in the couple to have, you know, kind of redo their marital contract to have some depth to it and have some meaning to it rather than, you know, buying a new BMW or, you know, being able to provide, but, you know, a much more spiritual base for what love is to mean for any two people. You mean not just the acquisitive consumeristic way? Right. Well, can I talk about Dan Brown and David Elliott's book for a minute? Sure. In how it relates to the, or conceptualizes the idea of the fundamentals for secure attachment. Because we're talking about avoidant attachment. I mean, let's think about what the necessary components are. What are the foundational pieces for secure attachment? So I'm just going to quickly as quickly as I can manage to do anything, um, go through what they identify in my interpretation of what they've identified as the kind of five pieces. So one, in the child, a sense of felt safety, felt safety, not theoretical safety, felt safety. And what's necessary in the um, caregiver for the child to experience that is protection, being protected, not overprotective in that crippling way, but not underprotective, but being fiercely protective. That is what allows for a sense of felt safety. And sometimes I just think of other mammals and, you know, how a lioness would be with offspring if they were threatened in some way. A lioness is not on guard all the time, but, you know, springs into action when needed fiercely. And a lot of people have not had that. Second, feeling seen and known. I think that that's what most people are desperate for in their relationships with other human beings. But by the time we've become adults, we're terrified of it. Because what if we're seen and known and found wanting? And since we believe we are, because that's what's internalized, it's a precarious thing to desire, but everyone needs to feel seen and known. And, and for that to exist in the first intimate relationship that a child has, feeling seen and known requires a very attuned partner, a very attuned caregiver. And if you yourself weren't attuned to it may be hard to it may be hard to do that in yourself. I mean, I think of a client I once had who had anorexia and had one hell of a long battle. And you know, she, I met her mother and she said, "You know, I did everything by the book. I did everything just right. I fed her at these times and I did this at this time and I did I made a schedule and and it's like her mother so tried to paint by numbers just right that she totally missed the child's natural rhythms and this and this patient then 
just like was so out of touch with her own natural, her proprioceptive signals, her own body, her, it just had been sort of written roughshod over, but again, through nobody's intent to do harm, just the opposite. But attunement, attunement is part of what feels, fuels the feeling of feeling seen and known in safety, in attachment. Felt comfort, felt comfort, because we need to be comforted. We need to have someone who will provide soothing and reassurance, appropriate soothing and reassurance for the age and developmental level of the child. And that means soothing at a physical level and soothing at an emotional level. You know, again, I think about a friend of mine who just adored her little daughter. And I just remember she would talk to her all the time. But I was thinking to myself for about the first three years while I watched that relationship, how can that kid possibly understand what her mother's saying? Her mother's explaining everything like crazy all the time. And it must be that just, it's so not at the level that a child can absorb. I wonder what that's doing. So again, then finally feeling valued, feeling valued in a, in a unique way, like uniquely valuable. And for that, it's the parent being able to delight in the child. And I just recently, a client was saying to me, yeah, I think that was a big missing piece because my parents were in no condition to feel delight about much of anything. And I think that I was a burden, not a delight. And therefore I feel like a burden and not a delight to anyone I might inflict myself on. And nothing could have been farther from how other people felt about this person. Other people felt this person as a delight, but the person themselves had internalized something really different. And then finally, the support. Well, Dan and David put it in terms of felt support for becoming one's best self, which is, in my opinion, it's felt support for unfolding and for one's own unique self. So it's felt support for, for unfolding and for what I think you're calling differentiation. And for that, there has to be unconditional support and encouragement. And I think sometimes, you know, when people grow up with a lot of rigidity and a lot of rules, they're like, well, I'm not going to do that to my kids, which is good. I'm not going to constrain the shit out of them and make them conform to what I think is right. But then sometimes there's no guidance. And 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 the kid's like, what am I, but, but, but what am I supposed to do? And I think it's very hard, actually, to not put one's own expectations on a child and yet to not leave them without some structure for how to navigate in the world. Let's take what Lori's saying now. Well, the way I've interpreted what she's saying is the concept of a love map. A love map to me is sort of like a language. If you're raised in a country that speaks English, you speak English, but you don't think about speaking English, you just speak it. And I, I don't think people have a love map or a language of how to love. And so they're speaking, you know, gibberish. And so in this last slide, we can turn to that. Brown and Elliot's kind of template. And what they do is they do pre hypnoprojective techniques which is they have individual uh, go into a, a trance-like state and imagine in their mind what it might be like to be in a fully intimate relationship. So imagine a scene where the kind of balance of closeness and freedom a relationship gives you. Imagine just the right kind of relationship where you're totally secure. Picture yourself being able to ask for advice and help. You can feel 
in your body what it's like to know this person. And someone down the line, you can read this for yourself. But, you know, when I first saw it, I just loved it because it, it was instead of conceptualizing intellectually what it might be like to be intimate, it was a person experientially beginning to imagine themselves actually being. And typically what you get when you do this kind of work is you get resistance. You get defenses coming up. And the person either becomes numb or walls out or has great difficulty being able to do this. So this is not something you do once, but we were doing it in a group center setting kind of regularly. And we're then dealing with the individual resistances that come up because the person doesn't have any frame of reference of what it might be like to be in, a, in an intimate relationship. Anyway, it's a relatively new procedure. And, and you know, I, I think they're collecting data on it. At least David Elliott is. Dana, unfortunately, has died. These are, techniques are really robust. And I, what I love about it is, is that so often I felt like I'm trying to, to help create something that a person has no capacity to be able to, to enact. And so it's almost like they have to do the work in their mind first and begin to imagine it since they've never really had it. It's like one of my clients the other day, he was talking about having a, a brain tumor and having surgery. And then they did surgery. He thought he was going to die. He lived. And like the next week, he went back to work. And there was nobody there to take care of him. There was no soothing. Sad. And, you know, talking about expectations. And so now, as an, you know, since that time, there, there just was no understanding of what nurturing safety and attunement really had an about. So we had no frame or reference of, of what intimacy was. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, you know, like they did a bunch of studies back a ways where they had people imagine, you know, like practicing tennis, for example, or something and doing the strokes and, and to see if it would make any difference or do you actually have to go out and do it bodily? And there actually, there was great usefulness to doing it in imagery. So I would suspect that this is similar to envision being in such a relationship that was nourishing and that actually met all the ingredients, that had all the ingredients, you know, for what a person might not even be able to conceptually envision uh, is powerful. Right. Okay, let's take some questions. We're running low on time. Suzanne, you want to help? Yeah, you got three great questions here. First, how can secure attachment lead to substantial, mutually beneficial future planning for the couple and their family members, both emotionally, thoughtfully, and behaviorally? Well, I think, I mean, my, the question answers itself. How can it not? I mean, you don't need to do something extra. That state itself generates just what the person's asking about. I mean, think about it. If, if a child has secure attachment with their parents, the child's going to come home and say, why is this teacher being so mean to me? And the parent is going to sit down and give them 100% of their attention and going to talk about what is going on and help them figure out how to live in a world where teachers can be mean and what to do in a situation where a teacher can be mean and validate their experience. And then, you know, the world is filled with difficult people and we have to figure out how to be able to deal with them. And so that's secure attachment. And so in that, the child begins to learn when they have, you know, a boss at work who's mean, how to be able to deal with that without sabotaging their work or being miserable and learning how to live in the world. So secure attachment really is, how does one live in this very difficult, complex world we live in, in a robust sort of way? Yeah, let me see if I can say it. Um, it's really a good question. So part of secure attachment would mean that, just what Mark's saying, that 
the more vulnerable members of the family, whoever was vulnerable at whatever time, but the whole family could come and talk about things in a realistic way together, not in a way that inordinately burdened the younger members with responsibility for the older members' issues, but in a role appropriate kind of a way, like things didn't need to go underground. And when things don't have to go underground, then it fosters an atmosphere where, you know, things don't have to be secrets and you don't have to keep things to yourself because you're afraid of overburdening other people. And there's not perfectionism. There's just the ability. And there's what comes of sometimes being able to talk about things and share things, even things that can't immediately change, like, you know, a teacher at school. And that creates capacity also for metacognition because it it not only creates the welcome to bring information into the system, but it creates the ability to help people who've been on the planet longer, like the kids in the family, understand possibilities and options and what is and isn't personal and to create healthy interpersonal boundaries. So it's almost like something that generates positive results in so many directions, it would be hard to even say all the directions. Second question. I have a partner who has OCD symptoms. He has some anger and rage issues diverted to himself only. I'm struggling to watch him being angry because the cup was out of place in the kitchen. How can I help him as a partner? I feel like a people pleaser sometimes. Well, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard, isn't it? Because you want to help him, but perhaps he might want some relief from all that since it's negatively impacting the relationship. And if he decided he did, I think, you know, the first thing is maybe to see a psychiatrist who understands OCD pretty well. And the right medication is, I feel, personally and professionally very useful with obsessive compulsive disorder because it's a little hard to get the space that a person needs to do things differently with OCD because like you're off and running before you can stop and think sometimes. So perhaps the right clinician, the right psychiatrist, the right medication, and then the right kind of therapy. But Again, medication can go a long way for a lot of people, even people who have really been suffering for a very long time. So that might be a starting point. But I guess he would have to want that change. And I, I do know that it's certainly hard for people to be partners with people that need things certain ways. So there's a specific therapy for OCD, which is incredibly effective. It's just there's not a lot of clinicians trained in it. We do some OCD work here in exposure-based therapies and acceptance and commitment therapies are fairly oriented. So the cognitive behavioral therapies can be very useful, but also the depth work we're talking about today loosens some of that. Also, Rogers is a place that has an, an OCD unit. And I used to know more people on the staff there than I do in recent years, but I imagine they still have a good program. There's a follow on to that. What do you do if someone has similar symptoms who isn't ready or wants to change? Indeed. What do you do? I think it's accommodating to it and looking at it as, you know, it's an anxiety disorder. And so you can get away from the content and get back to the process, meaning like what's going on for you right now? And oftentimes um, all that OCD stuff is because they're avoiding dealing with something that um, they need to be dealing with. And so, you know, I think um, to be able to sit down and be able to sit down and say, what's going on for you right now? And oftentimes it's not about what it seems. But I think in a way it, it brings in a larger question, which what does anyone do when a partner's not interested in making changes and you feel 
perhaps even held hostage by the unwillingness of the person to make any changes in areas where you're like, no, we need some changes here. And I guess that's what things like, well, I think that's why ACOA and AA, what am I trying to think of? Coda Pants. Uh, yeah, Coda. Coda. I mean, that's what, you know, for partners of people so that, you know, a person can deal with their own stuff even while the other person may be in a phase of being pre-contemplative about change or not. So I'd say that, you know, eventually then a person has to decide how much and what it's worth it to tolerate, but that's a process. So one's own therapy is, I think, sometimes the way to go rather than trying to pressure the other person into changing. But again, it's a little complex because a person likes to strike a balance between not not enabling somebody to continue something that's not good, but also not being in an everlasting argument, trying to force the person to do something they're not feeling in a position to want to do. I'll give you an interesting answer to that, which is sometimes listening to one of these webinars is effective because for most people, they feel hopeless. That's part of the negative part of avoidant attachment that anybody can really help them. And so why bother? They're just going to get ripped off and disappointed. So sometimes these kinds of webinars, one of these webinars we did had 110,000 people watch it. And, and I'm getting people calling me from Nigeria. So, you know, Jeez. the world's changing. And we thank you for all coming. This has been a lot of fun for us. And um, feel free to get in touch with us if you have anything that we can help with. And we're in Monterey, California. And we're going to continue to do these as we have anything new and interesting to say. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day upcoming and happy Lunar New Year, Year of the Dragon. <laughs>